Hi, we've got a really good video for you here. Uh, we've got Grant Williams on a Skype conference call from Volpe's Investment Management in Singapore. And he's written some excellent articles and uh, he's got a YouTube pre presentation that I think you will be fascinated by that shows uh, what is causing the price action in gold and uh, that this price action can't continue. It's going to turn around soon and it's probably going to rise dramatically. And uh, uh, just a few days ago, I sort of uh, made an offhand comment that, you know, the way to prove this would be to look at, at another thing. And I'll show you that these are the last slides. But I think we've got sort of a smoking gun here that proves that there has been a uh, manipulation of the precious metals market and that uh, we're going to be seeing far higher prices soon. So Grant, how are you doing? Mike, I'm great. Thank you very much. Excellent. So the first thing, can you tell us what the fractional reserve pyramid scheme gold leasing is? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, fra fractional reserve lending is is nothing new. I mean, that's that's what underpins the entire financial system that the world uses and has used for for a number of years now. Um, and essentially, what what you end up with is multiple claims on every piece of the assets as, as it pertains to gold. Uh, the Western central banks have roughly seventy five percent of their of their reserves in gold bullion, and certainly the the, the G G seven. Um, and uh, what they tend to do is rather than have such a huge chunk of their assets sitting there earning no interest, they lease that gold out to so-called bullion banks. There's, there's six or seven household name banks which uh, which form that, that little group. And the bullion banks take that gold. Um, it's essentially a loan, so, it, so both sides uh, have it as an asset on their balance sheet. Um, and the bullion banks sell that gold into the spot market, and with the proceeds, they reinvest that into high-yielding securities. Uh, and as recently, there's there's been a very nice trade in uh, some of this uh, some of this um, debt in the southern European countries, Greek debt, for example, which was backstopped by the ECB to all intents and purposes. These guys could uh, borrow gold from the central banks at a handful of basis points um, and uh, reinvest the proceeds in Greek government debt that would pay them between five and nine percent, uh, depending on when they bought it. So it's a, it's a very good little way for, um, for, for the bullion banks to, to make some essentially risk-free and very sizable returns. So, uh, so, they, so they borrow this at a very, very low rate, like something like a quarter or a half percent per year. Yes. Uh, they, the they sell it into the market, which depresses the price when they add this supply to the market and sell it. Uh, they take out a hedge uh, to protect themselves from price fluctuations, and then they buy some uh, c something that is considered a safe asset that spins off uh, a lot more interest than they are paying on the asset that they borrowed and then sold. Right? Yeah, yeah that's that, that's essentially how it works. Got any comments on how ethical it is to borrow something and then sell it? Well, I mean, rehypothecation is uh, is integral to the financial system. I mean, th this is how things work. In a normal functioning market, you know, it's absolutely okay, I guess, because it, it's callable on demand. So, notionally, if if, if, I, loaned, banks borrow, if I loaned you my car for the weekend and you sold it, I'd be mad. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you would, but if we had a piece of paper in place saying that uh, I had to deliver it to you or you know, or, or a brand new one uh, on demand, then you know, at least you have a claim back on that. But, but obviously, yeah. until that claim's tested, uh, it's just a piece of paper. Yeah. Okay, so they, they the banks uh, sell it into the market and they buy some asset that spins off uh, interest that's far greater than they're paying. And then what happens? How does the pyramid uh, evolve? Well, you know, that, that gold, once that goes out into the marketplace, obviously uh, the, the bullion banks sell it into the marketplace. Someone buys it from them, sells it on again. Um, and so you end up with multiple claims on the same, uh, on the same ounce of gold. Now, that's, that's fine and it supports itself until you get a situation where the actual owner of the gold, in this case, one of the central banks, decides it wants that gold back because then obviously it issues uh, it issues instructions to have the gold replaced. Now, the bullion banks, assuming they don't have it or certainly don't have uh, enough to cover how much they borrow, they have to go out to the market and replace it in order to deliver it back to the central bank. And that's something we haven't seen happen 
Um, but uh, in the last couple of years, there have been a few a few incidents that have suggested that that's exactly where we're at now, this tipping point where the central banks actually start to want their gold back. And uh, we've got a, a rush to, to secure physical gold to deliver into those requests. Okay, I'm going to show uh, the first chart here, which is the price of uh, gold. And you've got a couple of lines drawn through it here. We have uh, line one on August 17th, 2011. Uh, what happened on August 17th, 2011? Well, it was an interesting day, Mike. Uh, Hugo Chavez, um, who was the then president of uh, Venezuela and, you know, almost a figure of fun in the press uh, for some of his more outlandish um, statements against sort of Western central banks and, and Western uh, practices, did, demanded uh, that the 99 tons of gold that he was holding at the Bank of England uh, be returned to Venezuela. Now, it was reported you know, pretty pretty sparsely, but the reporting that was done kind of almost painted it in, in comedic fashion. But um, but sure enough, Chavez asked for 99 tons of gold back for the Bank of England, and uh, and that request was was eventually honoured. It took a couple of months, but um, I think by November they they were literally parading armoured trucks through the streets of Caracas as the gold made its way back to the to the central bank vault. Um, but, but it was interesting because you know this this to me and I wrote about it at the time back in August 2011 you know this this was this was the start of uh, of what could turn into uh, an enormous game of musical chairs and the, and the price of gold in the, in the two or three days immediately following that request uh, spiked up to its all-time high of nineteen hundred and ten dollars roughly and then it quickly corrected back down again as you can see in the chart here but but it then kind of found a nice channel trade in some but as I wrote at the time, this was just potentially the tip of a very, very nasty iceberg. And, and you know, subsequent to Chavez, some smaller central banks similar requests. I mean, as opposed to Arnaz for some gold bank, I think um, uh, Ecuador uh, they had 26 tons of they asked for that back. I think most um, of our you know, viewers. Scenes, not I, I think most of our viewers don't realize that uh, that most of the central bank gold that countries hold, a whole lot of it is in the basement of the Bank of England and the New York Fed because they were the clearing houses of the previous gold standards that we were on. And uh, so uh, countries would store gold in the basements of the Bank of England or the New York Fed and if one country owed another country a payment, they could pick up a bar and move it from one pallet to another or just make a book entry. Uh, so there's a reason that the, the New York Fed and the Bank of England are sitting on all of this gold that actually belongs to other countries, uh, correct? Yeah, look, I, th I think it's a very important thing to point out, Mike. Uh, you know, we had, for a number of years, uh, the Washington Agreement on Gold, which, which limited the amount of sales that central banks could make in the gold markets. And the two big markets are New York and the Comex and the LBMA in London. So they kept the gold in those central banks, so it was, so it was at those marketplaces. So as you say, when they, when they did make these sales, it was a simple case of moving the gold between vaults. But since 2009, um, the central banks have actually stopped selling gold uh, net uh, en masse, and they're actually buyers now. So that's just another reason, if, if these guys have turned into buyers, why they really don't need to keep the bulk of their, of their gold overseas. So it, it makes all the sense in the world to, to uh, move it back. Okay. Okay, so then we entered a trading range here uh, that marked out by this uh, blue field. Uh, and then line two comes along, January 14th, 2013. Uh, what happened on that date? Uh, uh, well, this was, this, this was when things got really interesting. So as I said, after the Chavez move, we saw some small um, central bank requests to have gold repatriated. Um, and on that, on that day in January, uh, the Bundesbank in Germany, which is, uh, as a single country, is the second largest holder of gold in the world, declared that they were going to bring back uh, 350 tons of gold from uh, Paris back to Berlin. Uh, but more importantly, they were going to ask for 300 tons to be repatriated from New York. A um, couple of points around that that are worth mentioning. In November, uh, the previous November, a guy called Andreas Dobrev, who's one of the uh, governors of the, of the Bundesbank, made a speech in New York uh, saying how that they, you know, they were trusted partners with the Fed and, uh, and talking about how the, the, the Bundesbank were very happy with their gold being held in New York, um, and only for two months later them to turn around and, and essentially ask for 300 tons back. And a couple of days after, 
the, uh, the request was made, the Bundesbank announced that this process uh, to move 300 tons of gold was going to take seven years. It will be complete in 2020, which is, which is A, an extraordinary time frame for this to take place over, right. and B, uh, they haven't responded to any questions about why it would take seven years for, for, that, uh, for that process to be complete. Yeah, I think in your article uh, you said it would take uh, three 747s, uh, basically one day to return it. And, you know, when they uh, said that seven years statement, I said they should have asked me because I can deliver that, that gold in a day or two <laughs> to, <laughs> to Germany. But, um, uh, okay, so they made that statement and a and, uh, few months later, right away, gold is already falling. But a few months later, it falls big time. And I want to point something out to our viewers here is that in this blue trading, this blue field, this trading range, uh, the gold price had a, what's called a support zone. It would come down and it would bounce off of that support down, zone, and it did it one, two, three, and there's actually a fourth time here where it came down, uh, and a fifth, and then it broke through. Uh, now, this is over more than a year and a half, and so during this whole period of time, there's traders doing something called placing stop losses. If the price falls below a certain point, it's an automatic sell order that gets you out of your position so that you don't experience any further losses. But basically, it's a sale. So more gold goes into the market when a stop loss is triggered, pushing the price down. So if you have huge clusters of stop losses, all one of these big bullion banks has to do is just uh, sell a f uh, few million, hundred million dollars worth of uh, naked shorts, uh, basically futures contracts that are not backed by silver, just you make up paper silver and you sell it into the market. Once it blows those stop losses, then you have this tremendous cascading effect and the price is falling because they've triggered all these automatic sales. And then you get investors that are nervous and sell and you also get investors that get margin call that didn't have stop losses and they have to sell to, to get liquid again and, and pay off their margin. Uh, and then we had a little bounce and the price, but by that time, this is something also that's called painting the charts. Basically they had turned the gold price, if you're doing technical analysis on charts, it was now bearish, a very negative thing, and there's a lot of people that were declaring the gold bull market over with. And uh, so we're down here now, we've, we've taken a little bounce recently. Uh, we may or may not have seen the bottom, but I want, now that we've sort of explained some of the price action that's going on, I want to show you what is happening, and this was part of uh, Grant's article. Uh, the, uh, COMEX and the GLD exchange traded fund for gold, the inventories of gold that they have on hand. So um, can you explain this chart with the, this is the, we've got the yellow background here is the COMEX gold holdings. The green is the uh, ETF holdings, the GLD holdings. And then red is the gold price. And you can see when it starts to fall here in the dashed line, is the Bundesbank uh, repatriation request. So can you tell us about uh, what your suspicion was when you saw the, the gold just disappearing suddenly from the COMEX like this? Well, you know, Mike, it's, it's, uh, it, it, when you look at this chart, it, to me it was extraordinary that, that we would see um, so soon after a, a request for the you know a significant amount of gold 300, 300 350 tons is a significant amount of gold there's no magical no ways about it particularly as it's due on demand um in a market that really can't afford to to spit that sort of gold out in, in one lump um but to see but to see how that request coincided with this precipitous drop off in uh, in in gold stocks and it's worth pointing out how, how this how this works the comex warehouse um the gold in there is held in two uh two different ways. It's held as registered gold and eligible gold. Now, if it's eligible gold, um, that means it's gold that is marked for delivery to, a, a, to, to the owner of it. It can't be used to, to meet delivery requests. If it's registered, it just means it's, it's sitting there and it can be used to deliver. So the first thing we saw was um, 
a shift from registered gold to eligible gold, which essentially meant that people that owned gold in those warehouses were saying, okay, that's my gold. I want it allocated to me. I don't want it to be used for delivery. The next thing we see is that gold leaving the vaults. Now, concurrently, the, there was a huge drawdown in the holdings of the ETFs. Um, particularly the GLD, which is the one that most people understand and, and use as a trading vehicle. But there's a, an enormous amount of misunderstanding about how well, it was reported in the press that you know all this gold leaving the uh, ETF holdings was a very bearish event for gold uh, and implied that there were just nothing but to gold, but the mechanics of it aren't actually like that. Um, the way it works, notionally, if you own a share of GLD, you own a share on a tenth of an ounce a claim on a tenth of an ounce of gold, so you know, 10 shares would equal an ounce of gold. And, and people that don't understand it like to think that if they have that share, they can exchange it for an ounce of gold. Well, unfortunately, the truth is uh, a little different. In, in order to actually um, redeem your shares for physical gold, you have to have enough shares to form what's called a basket. That's, that's about 10,000 shares, uh, shares of GLD, which is about $14 million. So clearly, it's out of the reach of most people to actually switch those shares physical but what we see when, when we see those enormous drawdowns in um, in the GLD holdings uh, what's happening is the the, the, the bullion banks uh, who form what's called uh, authorized participants so these are the only guys who have the ability to create shares or exchange uh, shares for physical gold and if, if, if you did uh, own 14 million dollars of gold and you wanted to uh, uh, of GLD sorry and you wanted to exchange it for gold you would have to go through one of the authorized participants who are for the most part the bullion banks so you would request to them uh, to, to exchange your 10,000 shares of GLD for physical gold they would take those shares to the trustee HSBC um, the custodian sorry and they would exchange those shares for gold and deliver that gold to you so what we've seen as this, as the price has fallen, are a lot of small sellers of GLD, for example, uh, as you say, having stops triggered, uh, being panicked out of the position, and selling them. And they may be selling them in lots of a thousand, or three hundred, or ten thousand, or just but small amounts of GLD shares, which are being hoovered up by the authorised participants. Those guys can then aggregate them, uh, take them to the custodian, and swap them for physical gold. So as we're seeing this drawdown in um, in the, the holdings of the gold in the GLD, it doesn't mean there's a, an overwhelming amount of sellers because every every seller of paper there's a buyer of paper. It doesn't it doesn't affect the gold. What's happening is the sellers are being aggregated uh, into large enough blocks to be able to redeem. Uh, and in the last you know, three or four months, we've seen almost 30 percent of the holdings of GLD, uh, physical gold holdings, be withdrawn by the authorized participants. So this, uh, this gold is, is basically uh, disappearing into some very strong hands. It's very few people that could actually do this. It requires somebody like a big bank or a big investment house to be able to take this gold uh, out of the GLD vault, right? Absolutely it does. And I think perhaps more importantly, there, there, is, there is anecdotal evidence uh, you know, and I don't have proof of this, but, but I, 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 I've seen anecdotal evidence from people that have tried uh, to, to redeem shares in, in sufficient size to be able to do so through the authorized participants and have been told that uh, they, can't, they can't have it. So the, the gold that's being, uh, that's being kind of shaken loose is going into the authorized participants who are, again, the bullion banks who you know, I, I suspect are struggling to fill shorts to meet these central bank requests. Uh, and it's not it's not going out the other side to individual investors. Yeah, so the, the bullion banks are short central bank gold because they borrowed it and sold it, and now they're trying to get enough gold back to return, and they're emptying out the vaults of the COMEX and of GLD. And I've, I've got the uh, chart here that's, that we've done that's recent just to show you the scale of this. The COMEX uh, holdings here, that, st that scale starts at zero, and goes up to about 85 tons was the average up here, or 83 tons, something like that. And then suddenly it has fallen down to about 23 tons. This is enormous drawdown. Now this scale here starts at 900 and goes to 1500. So we're talking about uh, going from uh, about 1330 uh, tons all the way down to just over 900. So you've got a, a, a 
an enormous drawdown here of about, it's, it's greater than 33%, I believe. I haven't worked out the exact percentage, but it's huge, the amount of gold that has left the vaults. And uh, a few days ago, I just uh, mentioned that you know a good way to prove whether this is price action or not, causing these, uh, the gold to leave the vaults, if, if it's just too cheap, is uh, to just basically do the same chart with uh, the COMEX silver inventories and SLV, the exchange traded fund for silver, and see if silver is also leaving the vaults. And when I did that, we come up with silver rising in both instances. At COMEX and on SLV, the inventories of silver are becoming greater where the inventories of gold are falling off of a cliff. So there's some huge fundamental difference between the gold buyers and the silver buyers. Uh, so I believe that this is a smoking gun that supports Grant's thesis that it's central bank, a central bank short squeeze that is causing this price action and gold to leave the vaults of both the commodities exchange and GLD. And so what this means is that when this uh, finally turns around and gold, it's, gold starts rising again, gold and silver, that this is just going to be a vicious bounce, I believe. It's going to be um, exciting. And we should be seeing, I, I think, uh, you know, probably before the end of the year, we're going to be seeing far, far higher gold prices than where we are right now. However, the entities that are, that are doing this, if this is the big bullion banks trying to re reacquire their position in gold so that they can return it to the central bank, then uh, you know, these are some very strong hands. And so we could be seeing another low in gold, uh, but it could be that the bottom is already in. So I just wanted to, I want to thank you, Grant, for uh, joining us and uh, going through all of this. Have you got any comments on uh, seeing the uh, SLV and uh, COMEX registered silver stocks as compared to what's been? I, I, I think that's I think that's that's an extraordinary chart, Mike. You know, it's it's a it's a it's a very simple thing to compare the two, and and there is clearly a disparity between them. And if you look historically, they tend to move in lockstep, both in price. Uh, and in in stocks and warehouses and such. So I think that's uh, that's an extraordinary chart. And and the one thing I would perhaps point out is that you know, whilst these guys uh, are trying to perhaps scramble back and, and, and cover this uh, Bundesbank gold, it's the tip of the iceberg. You know, all, all these central banks loan this gold out, and so not only do they have to make sure they have enough on on hand to deliver to the Bundesbank. But they have to have a sufficient cushion that when other central banks start doing this and requesting their gold back, um, they can meet those requests. So you know, I, I think this is the beginning rather than the end of this phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And uh, and what could happen to this stuff in, in a constricted market um, could be could be incredibly interesting. I suspect going forward. Okay. Well, thank you very much for joining us, and uh, we're going to send as many people as possible to see your article and your presentation on YouTube. Thank you. It's a great pleasure, Mike. Thanks very much for having me. Okay, bye. And by the way, we just finished up the second episode of Hidden Secrets of Money. And so if you have not already done so, please visit our website, hiddensecretsofmoney.com and sign up for the email notification when the new episode is being released. Thanks.